everybody, and welcome to the EHT panel on the Event Horizon Telescope results. So we have a panel of experts here to, um, d to help you dive into the shadow of the black hole. So first, let me introduce to you the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. These are 120 of our 200 plus member collaboration. The EHT is truly global in that its membership is comprised of people from Europe, Asia, Africa, North and South America. The goal of the Event Horizon Telescope project is to image for the first time the shadow of a black hole. So if you look up at the night sky, um, down in the Virgo galaxy, in the Vir in Virgo constellation, there is a, a galaxy called M87. In the M87 galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole that has the second largest apparent size as seen from Earth. Um, in this galaxy, there is a powerful jet of plasma that is uh, believed to come from the supermassive black hole. This jet pierces through the entire galaxy, can be seen in visible light and in radio. Radio waves are unimpeded by dust. With them, we can, pe we can peer through the entire galaxy, follow the jet down to its heart. As we go to higher resolution and higher observing frequency, we go to the base of the jet, where there is the shadow of the black hole, surrounded by a ring of light, imaged for the first time by the Event Horizon Telescope. So to be able to image uh, a black hole, we need to have um, high resolution to make an image of the features we're trying to see about 55 million light years away. So in order to get, uh, since um, resolution scales with the size of the telescope, we need a telescope the size of the Earth to be able to see the shadow of the black hole in M87. Unfortunately, nobody would let us fund that, so we have to get around it by multiple telescopes. So the EHD is a computational telescope. It's not actually a telescope the size of the Earth. We use many small telescopes around the globe um, at different large distances and connect them. We use a principle called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, or VLBI, which basically uh, helps us connect um, the telescopes in our network and synthesize a telescope, virtual telescope the size of the Earth. So say we have a distant source um, far away, because it's so far away, and the radio emission it emits arrives as plane waves um, at the telescopes. Because of the geometry of the Earth and the distances between the telescopes, there is a time difference in their arrival time of the signal. This time difference um, is actually um, timed really accurately by atomic clocks, or masers. These clocks actually lose a second every 100 million years, so they're extremely precise. So by uh, timing the arrival of the signal, we actually timestamp the signal at each telescope and record it onto our hard drives. We essentially freeze the light that is arriving at each telescope, record it, and then combine it later on in post-processing. So the distances between the telescopes tell us about um, the source structure we're seeing. The closer telescopes are together, the more signal they can see in common. So they actually tell us about the large-scale structure uh, of the source. As you take telescopes further and further apart, they see less signal in common, and so tell us about the finer scale structure of the, uh, of the source. Um, so in order to make an image, you need a large range of scales and a large range of orientations of the telescopes. So to do that, you need to um, have many telescopes at different distances and different orientations on the Earth. So the EHD observes at a frequency of 230 gigahertz. Radio waves at 230 gigahertz are unfortunately can get scrambled or attenuated by water vapor and uh, disturbance in the atmosphere. The EHD gets around that by borrowing telescopes that are at very high and dry sites at some of the most extreme remote locations on Earth. Here are some of the telescopes of our 2017 campaign. There's the SMT uh, in, in the mountains of Arizona, the JCMT on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, the LMT in this um, on the volcano Sierra Negra in Mexico, the IRAM 30 meters telescope on Pico Veleta in the Sierra Nevada in Spain, the Apex telescope and the ALMA telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile, one of the driest deserts on Earth, the SPT at the geographic South Pole in Antarctica, and the SMA on, the, um, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. As you can see, these telescopes were extremely different. They look nothing like each other. The reason for that is that the EHT actually borrows them and equips them, but the telescopes were actually originally designed for completely different science. So although our telescopes have different designs and operations, 
um, they have one thing in common, or actually two things. Um, one thing is the atomic clocks that record and timestamp the signal. And then we have our amazing um, EHT custom recording equipment. With this recording equipment, which you can see on the left here, um, this signal is uh, sampled, um, recorded in these uh, little boxes that are called modules. Each module is, stack is a stack of standard hard drives. In our 2017 campaign, we used 92 of these modules across the entire array, or 736 standard hard drives. During our observations, we have to keep a very close eye on the weather. So we use our VLBI monitor, which actually keeps track of the weather and forecast at each site. In order to make observations, we basically need to keep a close eye that all the weather is excellent at all sites to guarantee a strong signal recorded at each telescope because of the atmosphere. In our 2017 campaign, um, we had a 10-day window, and we had five days where we triggered observations with the best weather possible. Of course, none of this would be possible without our instrumentation, hardware, and software teams, and our operators and observers that go to these remote sites and carry out our observations, test our equipment, and uh, gather these data for us. Um, so now I'm going to pass on to Lindy, who will talk to you about how we get this recorded data and transform it to uh, perfect data for data analysis. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so I'll be talking about the data pathway. So this is how we uh, come from these signals recorded at the telescopes uh, to the set of data on the right that's used for imaging. Uh, and this is a bird's eye view of the data. So uh, we begin with all the telescopes pointed at the same source, so recording uh, signals at the same time straight to hard disks, you know, about 1,000 hard disks, as Sarah mentioned. Uh, then it turns out the fastest way to get them all the same place is physically picking them up and moving them. So we ship them all to our correlation center. And the correlation center plays back this frozen light. It really forms the virtual mirror here of our telescope in a very fundamental way. Um, during an another stage of calibration, we extract those signals from the data and measure their properties. And finally, after this, we're ready for forming the image. And this is where the image is actually made, during image reconstruction. One of the stories of the EHT is just the massive amount of data we process. So you know that the image that you've seen now, it's, it's pretty, pretty famous. It's really a little blurry, you know, maybe characterized by about 100 pixels or so. Uh, it fits on a kilobyte. You can send it by email. And we're beginning with petabytes of data that we record. So this is about 12 orders of magnitude in data reduction, a huge amount. And it really reflects the amount of noise we have to, to mitigate and the amount of complexity we have to remove from our data before we can actually make the image. Uh, so stepping back a little bit from, from the beginning and the signals, uh, I'm, I want to explain the correlation process because it's so fundamental to the way uh, interferometer like the EHT works. Um, so what we want to measure between each pair of stations is something called a correlation coefficient. And this, this uh, describes how similar the signals are that are recorded to each station uh, and between pairs of stations. Um, this is a very simple formula. You pull it off Wikipedia. Um, but when normalized, the signals are basically 0 if they're completely unrelated and 1 if they're perfectly correlated. We add all the rest of the sites and align them in time. And the correlator can form this correlation coefficient between each pair of antennas. Um, so the interferometer becomes very powerful as we add new stations to the array. Uh, now, there are a couple things that make this process hard. And this is why this is not so straightforward. One is that the correlation coefficients that we expect are actually quite small. Uh, and the reason is because the signals are noise dominated. There's a lot of atmospheric background thermal noise that dominates. And the correlation coefficient we expect is, could be one part in a million. And we need to average many millions of, of samples just to be able to get a detectable signal. And the other problem is the atmosphere is scattering the, the timing of our, our clocks, really, the timing of our data, in ways that make it very hard to do this averaging. So the atmosphere I bring out, because it's, it's fundamental to, this, uh, to observing at these high frequencies in the radio, and this is just a, just a picture of some real data over, over a few minutes. And the red is atmospheric phase. And this is really uh, talking about how the signals are delayed randomly by turbulence. And from the bottom to top of one of these panels is one wrap of phase. And at 230 gigahertz, that's about four picoseconds. So uh, we're really talking about very small amounts of timing jitter, but causing a very significant uh, effect in our data. Uh, we use our methods to, to model this out and get something nice and stable, after which we can collapse all this data into one single point. So this is one example of how the data is simplified during the calibration process. Um, we developed three independent pipelines to do this. Uh, this is a theme during our data reduction. We do things in parallel ways. Um, so this is three software pipelines. And the, the underlying libraries here actually are written in, in C, 
C++ and Fortran, but all the pipelines are actually in Python. And many of the uh, fitting routines are actually fundamentally uh, based in, in, in Python. But once we uh, put our data through all these three calibration pipelines, we can then use that uh, parallelization and that independent uh, processing of the data to, to run a bunch of cross comparisons. So this is what, what I show here. And uh, at this stage of the data processing, we're just concerned with making sure we're getting the same results from all of our uh, independent reduction pipelines. Another aspect of calibration that's very important is, is folding in the sensitivity of the stations. So I mentioned before the correl correlation coefficient is a number between 0 and 1. But to translate into something physically meaningful, we fold in the sensitivity estimates. And because we're using such different stations around the, the Earth, um, this is important for physically interpreting our data. This is just one representation of the data before, uh, before processing, uh, before folding in sensitivity. And what we have here is the degree of similarity between signals recorded at two sites versus the length of the baseline between the stations. And after folding in station sensitivities, we get something that reflects a very simple and elegant structure to the data. And if we overlay what we expect on this spectrum of the data from just a simple ring model of a source on the sky, we see that it's a pretty good match. So we have this amplitude spectrum. We also have the phases representing the time difference between signals recorded at different stations. And this is our fundamental data product that we can then pass to imaging. And uh, I'll hand it to Kazu to begin talking about that process. Okay, so thanks, Lindy. Um, so, um, so Sarah and Lindy uh, provided an excellent introduction of how the EHT works. So uh, EHT is assembling eight telescopes in this planet that create a planet-sized telescope with incredibly high angular resolution capable of imaging a black hole for the first time. So now you can see uh, the, the Earth seen from M87, and you can see that with Earth rotation, a new telescope is joining the array, and you can see that a battery r size telescope uh, have uh, you know, virtual meters uh, with the Earth rotations, and we got a corresponding data set. But you can also realize that because we have a limited number of stations in this planet, so uh, our virtual meter is really sparsely sampled. So that creates a situation that um, so there are infinite number of images that can actually perfectly explain our data set. So at the imaging process, each imaging technique or each imaging algorithm that create image from observing data set uh, try to derive the most likely image um, from the sparsely sampled data set based on its prior knowledge or its prior assumptions. So in the history of the radio astronomy, there are New two classes of imaging techniques. The first one is the most popular and the most traditional technique, so-called Queen. So Queen is an inverse uh, modeling approach um, that, that tries to derive a reasonable solution um, from, from the image domain in an interactive way by the input of users. But Queen has a long history of more than 40 years, and it has been tested validated and used by community for a long time. That's a really, really good advantage. On the other hand, that interactive nature of the queen actually needs a lot of user input and also expertise of some professional's knowledges. And, and also, it's also um, uh, a little bit difficult to incorporate many observing effects directly in the imaging process. So that's why we developed another class of new imaging techniques that take a forward modeling approach. So that is a Bayesian-inspired method that can include a lot of prior uh, assumptions of, or prior knowledges of the images, or sometimes combination of them. We can also incorporate a lot of observing effects. So for instance, what are the systematic errors uh, remain even after the calibrations? So the new imaging technique is more flexible imaging process that can match it more with the actual observing process. So such a development of new imaging techniques is actually one of the prime innovation in the EHT collaborations. So there are a number of imaging techniques that developed in the last several years um, to make the first ever black hole images. And most of, images, uh, most of imaging techniques are implemented in uh, two uh, independent imaging libraries. The first one is a EHT imaging library, and another one is a smiley. So both two new li libraries are a completely open source and Python interface and, and in GitHub. And 
and as Nat uh, mentioned in the beginning of this conference, actually these two new imaging libraries are using a lot of libraries actually developed by uh, many communities. So that means um, you know, a number of people in many communities actually contributed to make these two new imaging libraries that actually created the first ever images of Waco. This is a really, really cool thing. Thank you. <laughs> so um, after a number of inspections of data, so finally we got a decalibrated data set of M87. So what we did in the first seven weeks is that we split um, entire imaging group to, uh, the, to the four fantastic teams, say, fantastic four. Um, <laughs> so each imaging team have a, a variety of people uh, that have expertise of both traditional and new imaging techniques. And also, there are some characters um, in terms of the uh, population of regions. And also, they have also some modest technical preference. For, the, for instance, uh, the first two teams have uh, some preference uh, to use the new imaging techniques. On the other hand, the latter two teams have a modest focus on the traditional techniques. Anyway, so each four team actually worked on M87 data independently without any exchange of information with outside of the team. And seven weeks later, we united together at the Harvard University at the end of July uh, 2018. And, and this photo actually is showing the exact moment when we compared uh, images across four teams for the first time. And you cannot see results, uh, unfortunately. But uh, you can see, actually, what are the results from the people's face, particularly you know, Katie's really, really smiley face you know, in front of participants. So here is uh, the first images compared across the four teams. So um, these images are made, of, uh, made from the engineering data release. So that are not coming from the final data. Data have still some issues. But, but we actually got a very consistent basic structure. So for instance, all images have a link with a very uh, consistent diameter. And then also, this link is not symmetric. You, know, you, can, you can see that clear asymmetry where the lower side, I mean, southern side is wider. And this basic uh, uh, structure is, not, is, is even seen in the, you know, our final images that press release on April 10th. So we got, well, basically, uh, the basic structure at this time with engineering data with independent four teams. That actually provide a certain confidence about our results. So this is another memorial photo taken after the first comparison of images. You can see a single uh, M87 image here. So this is the average of all four teams' images. This is actually really similar to what we presented in a press conference. And then also, you can also see a you know, fantastic international team that actually spent several years to develop new imaging techniques and also work hard to create the first ever picture of the black holes. So this is a truly uh, collaborational effort. And, and actually, we are proud of uh, uh, our fantastic imaging team. So the next speaker, Andrew, will give uh, actually how we reach at the final images that press release on April 10th. Uh, thanks, Kazu. Um, so yeah, once we had done this imaging process with four different blind imaging teams, we were pretty good confidence that we weren't sort of deluding ourselves into thinking that this image um, was there in the data and that different imaging methods designed with different um, techniques could reproduce the same um, fundamental image. Um, but then we still had the question of how do we best tune the knobs on our virtual camera um, to get us the best possible image or the most um, reliable image from all these different algorithms. Um, and so we have three different software packages that we used um, in this next step of imaging, um, one based on the traditional clean algorithm cause you described, and then the two that were developed specifically for the EHT and really built on all of this open source Python software, as uh, cause you described. So we wanted to objectively sort of determine what the best way to tune all these different knobs in the, um, in the image would be. Um, so the way that we did this is we tested tens of thousands of different imaging parameter combinations systematically. So we did this on a suite of synthetic source images. And we demanded that our different imaging parameters could really distinguish between these sources and all the different ways that these sources might be fooling us into giving us uh, similar images. We only chose the parameters to apply um, to M87 that were the most trustworthy. At the end of the day, while these different um, imaging methods have different um, 
resolutions and so also slightly different images, when we blur them to a fundamental um, equivalent resolution, we get very similar images, um, really giving us confidence that these images are robust to all the different imaging choices that we've made. And then these images um, combined together, we actually simply average them to give us the final image of M87 that we shared with the world on April 10th. Um, so the next part of my discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about measuring the mass and the size of the black hole. Um, so it turns out that measuring black hole mass is actually very difficult um, because you're really indirectly looking at it. So the best way to can do it is with these direct images. Um, and previous Im methods have really disagreed and are very, very difficult to do. Um, so the mass of a black hole is proportional to the size of its shadow. So if we can measure the size of the shadow, we could really accurately measure the mass. And the exact value depends on the details of the surrounding material and on the calibration. Um, so we really needed to approach this problem uh, systematically. And the way that we did this is a common f uh, theme in the EHT. We used three different imaging techniques to measure, um, three different techniques to measure the size of the shadow. So we could really uh, verify that we were doing um, this correctly and that our answer made sense. The first was we can just measure directly from the image. We can just take a circle around the ring um, and uh, measure the size this way and the uncertainty on that size. The next is we can model the data using simple geometric shapes. So in this framework, we um, basically decompose the image into a simple collection of geometric shapes um, and fit these shapes um, to, the, to the underlying data. And we do this um, using a sort of Bayesian sampling and parameter estimation framework, um, such as this one, which really samples the space of uh, uncertainties of the different parameters of our image that we're, that we're sampling. And the third way is that we can fit individual frames from supercomputer simulations that Roman will talk about next um, to the underlying image. Um, and so this, when we, um, yeah. And so all three of these different methods actually use three new different software packages that were designed. Um, the first two designed for the EHT. The first, a modular um, MCMC framework called Themis that Roman will talk about. The second, Gene, which relies on um, machine learning algorithms, uh, genetic algorithms. Um, and then Dynasty actually is a software package developed by a grad student at Harvard um, that we encountered. Um, and He's designed it for a completely different problem. And so then we um, applied it to this, um, to this EHT problem. And it worked perfectly um, and really gave us confidence in the other results. So I think that was just a really great example of how um, sort of this collaboration can work. Um, at the end of the day, we found consistent mass measurements using all three of our different techniques. We found actually that M87 is one of the most massive black holes known in the universe. It's 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. I, mean, I just really love this XKCD comic that came out the day after um, our announcement because it really put into perspective. I think we throw out numbers all the time, but really this image was the first to give me at least the actual perspective of how big this black hole is, um, as big as the solar system, much bigger than the orbit of Pluto. Um, yeah, like I said, one of the, most, the biggest black holes known. So next I'm going to turn it to Roman to talk about the theoretical interpretation of this image. All right. Thanks, Andrew. So, um, so I think now you've um, gotten a really good idea and a good appreciation for how difficult uh, and challenging it is to, to make these measurements, to then understand, calibrate, and therefore reduce the data, and then to reconstruct an image, right? Um, and now I would like to um, pose to you a couple of additional questions that you might be interested in. So let's take a look at this image again, and I would like to start at square one and ask, what do you see in this image? I think we can all agree that there, is, um, that there is a bright ring of emission. We can agree that the lower part of the ring is slightly brighter than the upper part. And there is a dark region inside the ring. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a ring. Um, but now, you've discussed features of the image. Um, but now the questions that, that, um, that theorists are posing themselves is, how do we know that it's a black hole? Or um, why does the image look the way it does? Or in other words, what's actually going on that gives rise to this, to this emission? And of course, the theoretical implica implications. What does this all mean? And for all those three questions and related questions, you need a theory. So Andrew, in the previous talk, told you already one important ingredient in answering question number one, how do we know it's a black hole? A very important um, ingredient is, well, you first have to measure the data. But then second, you need a theoretical prediction. Andrew told you that the mass of the black hole is related to the angular size. But that's only true because you've assumed a theory that makes this prediction. Without this theoretical prediction, you, um, you look at this image in a completely different way. And it's much harder uh, to gain any confidence uh, in the fact that you're actually staring at a black hole. It could be um, an exploding envelope of a star, for example, or something like that. But there is a theory that tells you 
um, if you have a mass, uh, if, you, if you have a black hole of a certain mass, it should have this size. Now, um, why does the image look the way it does? I need to dig a little deeper uh, for that on the, on, the next, on the next few slides. The theory for black holes really was kick-started um, when Albert Einstein, in 1915, published his revolutionary theory of gravity he called general relativity. It was in 1915, and it was in this very city, right in Berlin, um, 104 years ago. And um, to his own surprise, it took only one year uh, until Carl Schwarzschild found the first solution to his equations. And we now know that that solution describes the gravitational field of, of a black hole. And it took until 1963 until Roy Kerr was actually able to generalize Schwarzschild's solution um, to allow the black hole also to have a spin. So um, Albert Einstein's theory was a, was a big revolution because unlike a Newtonian theory, where there is a rigid framework of space and time, and gravity is just uh, forces acting on masses. In Einstein's theory of, of, of gravity, you have a construct of space-time that gets bent and warped by the presence of mass and energy, and mass and energy moves uh, in response to the curvature of that space-time. So one of the um, strange and perhaps defining properties of black holes is what we call the event horizon, a surface of no return. A surface where um, if you dip things into it, they are lost to the exterior world forever, even light. So if light gets too close to a black hole, it gets absorbed, falls into the event horizon, and never gets out. So that's very useful if you're trying to explain a dark region in an image. Okay? It's not so great if you have a bright ring around. So what about that bright ring? Where is that light coming from? Well, we need to dig a little deeper, and we need some simulations that I will show you on the next slide. So you see in this uh, lower image that the, these light rays that are getting closer and closer to the black hole, and the closer they get, the more they're deflected by the black hole until they get too close, and then they get absorbed by the black hole. And that's what's giving rise to what we call the shadow, the lens structure of the event horizon that we see at infinity in our telescopes. All right, so, um, so what, what, what happens around this black hole? What's actually physically going on that gives rise to this emission? Well, let me take you a second time uh, on a journey to M87. We're going to zoom in, and um, we're going to go through the same scales that you saw before. Um, now we're approaching scales uh, where you can see with a Hubble telescope this fantastically bright jet region that points you to the center of the galaxy. And now you don't see an image, but you see a simulation that shows you what happens to the gas as it orbits uh, the, the black hole and as it falls onto the black hole. It turns out it's a very turbulent, very wild environment. The gas heats up to billions of degrees. And you see how the matter is ejected in these, uh, in these jets, in these very powerful jets. And then you turn this into an image, and I'll get to that in a second. You see in the left panel one of the, um, one of the images that we were able to extract. You see in the middle an image, a theoretical image, that was generated from one of the simulations you just saw. And you see on the right, a blurred version of that theoretical image. And the amazing thing is that the observed image and the blurred version of the theory image look very similar. And that gives us a great degree of confidence that we have some idea of what's going on. Okay? And the ring is caused by the, by the light that is lensed into your line of sight, because the black hole is focusing it into your telescope. And the bright part in the south is brighter because it's material that comes at you at almost the speed of light and things are much brighter when they approach you. So you have to turn the crank in comparing theory and data, and you have to do this many, many times. And here you see a whole library of these uh, simulations that I showed you, and each one of those takes a week or two to run on thousands of computational cores. And you have to turn these into images, many images that depend on viewing angle, on spin, on magnetic flux, on all kinds of things. And you need to vary and constantly um, compare data and theory to figure out what's going on, um, which models can explain the data, which ones cannot. And uh, Andrew mentioned this already. Uh, there are many software packages that we use for this. One of them is Themis. You can find Themis uh, on GitHub. It's hosted there. Um, there's a lot more uh, collaborators there that have uh, worked with Themis and other software packages. 
and we find nice agreement among those key to this progress and it, and it highlights the, the collaborative nature of our work which is also built, built into these software packages and we need extensible and modular codes that we can easily develop um, with a, with a long-term perspective. Okay, so um, here's, a, here's a view um, of Themis on GitHub. Uh, obviously, it's very useful for us to track changes in the code, uh, monitor progress, and even helps with validation of the code, and so on. So about the theoretical Im implications, just to summarize real quick. Uh, so the first ever black hole image, and in particular, the agreement of theory and data, um, is actually a game changer uh, for our understanding of gravity and jets. And so far, uh, Einstein's theory seems to be supported by the data, and also the black hole nature of the source um, is supported. In fact, we tried some black hole mimickers that are not quite black holes, but behave in a similar way, and they're disfavored by the data. Uh, and the question is, can we look for deviations from Einstein's theory? And uh, this is something that the next speaker, CK, is going to tell you more about and also about some of the other codes and software that were used in the process. Thank you. So thanks, Roman. Hello. OK, so uh, in these last few minutes, I want to go back to a few uh, very simple points. The first one is the Event Horizon Telescope is a scientific experiment. So uh, you're picking the image of the black hole is just the first step in an era of new gravity experiments. So um, the big question here is how gravity works and if Einstein is correct or not. And it turns out you're know, given all the confirmation that Roman just told us, there is a signature in this black hole image that can answer these big questions. So you know, I want to show you a software that we developed a few years ago that uh, will follow the geodesics of photon around uh, curved space time. So the idea there is um, you know, if we send a quarter million photons toward a black hole, um, you know, we will see you know, the, the algorithm will integrate the geodesics according to Einstein's equations. And some of them will hit the event horizon and got stuck there. Some of them will pass around the black hole, you know, orbit around the black hole a few times, and some of them will just fly through. And you know, just to give you a perspective, in order to create an image in the interstellar movie, it takes 100 CPU hours to render a single frame. But with this software that we developed, thanks for the GPU technology, we are able to compute a single image in three seconds. And using this kind of calculation and follow how like orbit around black hole, we realized that um, you know, if Einstein is correct, it turns out that the shape of the black hole shadow is independent of the black hole spin and the inclination angle that we look at it. And it's always a circle. So this is a very unique signature that we can use. And there are other kind of uh, your gravity theories out there, and they actually predict very different shape of the black hole shadow. So you know, in our collaboration, many of us actually want to disprove Einstein. But the fact that uh, you know, the black hole shadow is consistent with, the sh with a circle is indicating that Einstein is right again. But <laughs> he's always right. But you know, in the future, in the future, when we add more telescopes to our array, and um, you know, maybe even go to space, we will be we will be able to place you know, tighter constraint on general relativity and understand gravity better. And maybe at some point, we will you be able to tell which part Einstein is wrong. Okay. Um, so the second point I want to bring up to you is you know, modern science is advanced in the level that it requires large collaboration. The science and all the technology involved is so complicated that you know, there's no single team can, a single person can handle that. So you know, in the EHT, we have scientists with very different backgrounds, all working on different parts of the experiment. And the collaboration brings all of us together to achieve a single goal. And this is very similar to Git and GitHub. The distribution of Git allows developers like you to work independently, but at the same time collaborate on uh, your projects. And this is, again, a list of your important uh, open source software that we use in our collaboration. So thanks again. 
And at the end of the day, you know, GitHub bring everything together to form a community. And in that sense, the EHT and scientists in it, we are just part of the community. And we are trying our best to contribute back and make our software open source. So this is Smiley that uh, Kasu sh showed you earlier. Kasu is the lead in this software. And this is EHT imaging. Andrew is leading that. And Lindy and myself and other you know, people in the EHT are contributing. But one beautiful thing of putting this on GitHub is we receive contribution from people that we never met. They may not be astronomers, but they are experts in Python. They're experts in Docker. And their contribution help us improve the software. And at the same time, our team also use Git to version control our data. The result is our data analysis are reproducible. Reproducibility is the hallmark of science method. So this is very important. And it is my pleasure to tell you that uh, our team actually released both all three of our uh, image reconstruction pipeline and also a calibrated data set on GitHub. So all of you can go there, run the software. and create your own M87 image. And actually, there are already teachers out there use this software and data and put them into astronomy classes. And we are you know, just very excited to see how this can inspire a new generation of scientists. Uh, so the last thing I want to say is you know, science and technology are converging. The next big discovery is going to happen at the intersection of science and technology. And as open source, software developer, all of you are contributing all of you are contributing to this and all of you are part of this. So thank you very much for all of your hard work. <laughs> it's all of you. Do we have a couple of minutes for questions? Is there any? So there's a microphone there. If you have any questions for the panel, we can take one or two. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to know about the project or the software or, um, yeah? Th can you please go just go to the mic? There's a microphone right there, and then we can hear you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Um, I was wondering if there was any satellite uh, in the solar system that could be added to the telescope array to make it bigger. You asked if there was a satellite uh, in the solar system, like a planet yes. or a moon? So to go solar, sc um, uh, okay. solar system scale instead of planet scale. Oh, I, uh, so I mean, maybe you can take, take this on the space, space stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. so, um, so well, actually, the angular resolution of the EHT is limited by this, the size of this planet. So of course, if you go if we launch a satellite um, in the space, then, then we can increase. Um, uh, we can actually go to higher, free, a higher angular resolution. So, so for instance, if we launch a satellite on the mid Earth orbit where the GPS satellites are, then actually we can increase um, angular resolution by factor three or four. That actually provide maybe uh, another uh, horizon scale images of other supermassive local in other galaxies. Or we can also get much finer images uh, for the M87. Um, yeah, so that's actually one of our scope in the next decade. Thank you, Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, the rotation of the Earth, is that more like giving you accuracy, or is it taking it away, the accuracy? So is it helping for your res resolution, or is it worse, basically? 
Um, so actually, so we take into account the rotation of the Earth when we do our, our um, calibration. So our, when we combine the data together, we actually take into account how the Earth moves and how the telescopes move apparent to each other. Um, but the Earth rotation synthesis, which we use in imaging, actually helps us fill our coverage. So we basically use the Earth as our telescope to basically rotate beneath our feet and kind of, um, with it, we sweep different parts of the source. So we basically use the Earth to kind of sweep around different regions and different dimensions and orientations of the source and get more information about what we're observing. Thank you. Thank you. One more? Yes. Why M87 of all of the black holes? That's a great question. Um, who wants to take this one? Roman? OK. Uh, I'll give you a couple of reasons. It's, um, it's big. Um, OK. <laughs> Um, we can see through it. Um, that's not always the case. Um, so it happens to shine bright enough that we can see it. And uh, the stuff around is not opaque, so you can really pinch through it. And you can get this nice uh, ring. And we've looked at other sources, as you may have heard. Um, but this one was the one that, uh, that looked promising right from the start, as you could see uh, the, the, the moments in the slides. Uh, it just looked very promising, and so we focused all of our attention, and it's been uh, a lot of work, um, but there's more to come, for sure. Yeah, so we, we observed another black hole, Sagittarius A star, which is at the center of our own galaxy. It's the supermassive black hole in our Milky Way. Uh, but that one is a lot smaller, so it's a lot more variable. So M87 is like taking a picture of a, a person. It's a long exposure of a person ready f to take a portrait. Sagittarius A star is basically taking a picture of a running toddler in long exposure. So that's the kind of challenge we're dealing with next, is learning how to make movies. And we're going to need a lot, more, um, a lot more input and software help from the community to be able to, to tackle that challenge. So we're looking forward to that. I think we're, we're out of time. So thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>